Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for the Connecting Communities in Schools webinar series. Today, you are in the Building Bridges, a collaborative partnership between community, coalition, and schools. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is McLean Gutkin. I'm a member of the Schools Network. And the mission of the South Carolina Schools Network is to identify and promote healthy eating and active living strategies in South Carolina public schools that empower key stakeholders and encourage collaboration among those seeking to improve student health and academic achievement. Thank you, McLean. My name is Erica Ayers, and I'm the School Wellness Consultant with DHEC's Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity Prevention. And I also serve as the Executive Director for the South Carolina Governor's Council on Physical Fitness. And the mission of the council is to serve the state by supporting and promoting the health of all South Carolinians through the advancement of physical activity. One area of focus for the Governor's Council is to support student fitness, which is why they work in collaboration with the school's network. An example of this collaboration is this webinar series. The purpose in this series is to enhance the collaboration between schools and communities using the whole school, whole community, whole child model as a framework to support student health. And today we are gonna be focusing on health education and community engagement. And McLean, I will pass it back to you. Thanks, Erica. So today you are going to hear from Rachel Faubert. She is and uh, was South Carolina's 2023 Health Education Teacher of the Year. And you're going to learn how Aaron's Law is being taught in schools across our state and community resources that can help support the requirements of this law. You're also going to hear from Robin Cooper, who is the Regional Program Manager with the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, on how South Carolina's community health coalitions are partnering with schools to support student health and also community health. So I will turn it over to Rachel. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here today and to have this opportunity to talk to you about Aaron's Law. Um, so today we're going to be talking about Aaron's Law and the requirements of Aaron's Law instruction in the state of South Carolina. So a little bit of an overview of what we will go over today. We will talk first about what is Aaron's Law. Then we will talk about the requirements behind Aaron's Law, the role of a teacher, in South Carolina teaching Aaron's Law. We'll also talk about the warning signs of an abused child, what to do when a child discloses to you, anything about categories that fall under Aaron's Law, resources for talking to parents, what it means to be a mandated reporter, um, situations that would require reporting, as well as other curriculum resources that are currently available. Okay, so Illinois was actually the first state to pass Aaron's Law, so good job to those of you um, who were able to answer that question correctly. Um, South Carolina was which state to pass Aaron's Law? Great job. It was actually the 16th state. In what year was Aaron's Law passed in South Carolina? We're going to talk about this one this year, so that one was a close-up um, between 2016 and 2017. So we'll talk about that year in just a moment. And parents and guardians are able to opt out their student from instruction in child sexual abuse. That is a false statement. So great job answering the poll questions. And these are different topics that we will talk about throughout the presentation today. So Erin's Law was named after a childhood sexual assault survivor, and she is now an author and speaker and activist named Erin Marin. She is the founder and the president of Aaron's Law. Um, it was first registered in the state of Illinois. So that was one of the poll questions. What was the first state to adopt Aaron's Law? And Aaron's Law has since then been passed in 37 states. Another poll question that we had was South Carolina was the 16th state to pass Aaron's Law. So that's just a little bit of background information on Aaron's Law. Um, and this is current map um, in the United States of what states have passed. So currently 15 states have passed Aaron's Law. 22 states, um, this was being introduced in 23-24. So at the point of this map, 
we had not fully transitioned into Aaron's law. And then there was 13 states still in the process. So we kind of fell about middle of the pack and implementation early on within Aaron's law. Um, so when did Aaron's law become passed in South Carolina? Um, so this is a copy of the State Department of Education memorandum, which came out July 25th, 2016. And in this memorandum, it basically stated that students will participate in instructional units about sexual abuse and sexual assault awareness from grades four-year-old kindergarten through 12th grade. And then it went on to detail that this would begin in the 2015-2016 school year. So that was the answer to that poll question was 2016 was when it had to have full implementation. So what does Aaron's Law actually require? Um, there's a lot of different aspects about Aaron's Law and different areas of requirements that need to be implemented and fulfilled. Um, one of the first requirements is that students in grades pre-K, which is four-year-old kindergarten through 12th grade, that they participate in age-appropriate techniques to recognize the warning signs of child sexual abuse and strategies to help them communicate and tell a trusted adult. Another area is training school personnel about child sexual abuse, and this is something that should be occurring yearly. And parents and guardians, distributing information, sharing information at parent engagement nights, talking about the warning signs of child sexual abuse, plus needed assistance, referral, resource for information to support sexually abused children and their families. So these are parts that should not be done alone or standalone by a health education teacher, but relying on support from other individuals like school counselors and school social workers who could be able to help to implement Aaron's Law at your school. So your role as a teacher, um, these are some statistics about students. Um, one in four girls and one in six boys have actually been sexually abused by the age of 18. So if you don't think you know a student has happened to, think again, because these students sit in our classrooms every single day. Um, so it is our role to talk to students about safe, unsafe touches, safe and unsafe secrets, and making students aware that they are in a safe environment and they have adults around them that they can go to if they have been abused. So warning signs of an abused child, um, looking for sudden bruises, changes in appetite, um, wearing inappropriate clothing. For example, wearing long sleeves in warmer weather, um, talking very aggressively to other students, being suddenly very defiant, acting out, being very disruptive, coming to school extremely early, not wanting to go home, changes in grades, cheating, lying. Those are just some of the warning signs things to look for. And sometimes these warning signs are not evident at all. So what to do when a student discloses um, to you? What should you actually do? Um, one of the first things to remember is to never act shocked, um, just to remain calm in the situation. Praise the child by telling the child that they did the right thing. Never prying the child for information, not asking for leading type questions. Um, so basically just getting factual information, all you need to know is who, what, where, when, and that is pretty much where you want to cut the conversation off with the child. Let the child know that they are safe. Try to make them as comfortable as possible. Reassuring the child it is not their fault and explaining that the school does have the policy to notify the police. So really sitting down with the student and explaining the process to them, that can prevent the student from becoming maybe upset down the road or when they go to the counselor's office, you wanna prep them, know that they are going to be asked questions and just keeping the conversation again around all you have to communicate is the essential questions, basically who, where, and when, and what took place. So talking to parents, um, one of the things that educators should be trained to do um, as a mandate reporter, is to never contact the student's parent if a child discloses any information. So not picking up the phone because then that could trigger more problems down the road. Um, a parent may want to try and have their child recant abuse if they know it's been reported. Um, there's the risk of the parent may taking off with a child and going into hiding. And a parent may confront an abuser if they know about the situation has been reported before police are actually involved. So that all deals with keeping not only the child safe, but in sometimes 
not making the situation escalate too quickly until all parties are there and available to be supportive. Um, so in South Carolina, um, educators are mandated reporters. Um, so according to the Keeping Children and Family Safe Act of 2003, um, it was a reauthorization of the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act. So it has standards for defining um, child physical abuse and sexual abuse and neglect and talking about how educators and other parties have to be mandated reporters. So if you suspect a child is being abused, you have to contact Child Protective Services immediately and the police. Um, if you are in a school type setting, this is not something that you would want to do alone. You would want to involve your school counselor, your social worker, and um, other individuals like school resource officer and administration. So you're not making that phone call alone and you're supported and they're aware of the situation prior to making the phone call. Um, situations that require reporting as a mandated reporter. Um, a child has shown warning signs of being abused. A child has stated that he or she has been abused. A child has stated that another child has been abusing them. An adult discloses that they have abused a child. Um, a child becomes aware of child pornography online. Um, an adult is aware that another adult or child is viewing child pornography and a child states that their friend or family member is being abused. Um, so each district in South Carolina is actually allowed to select their own curriculum to teach Aaron's Law. Um, there are recommendations on the South Carolina State Department of Education website, but the nice part is that each district is actually able to select their own curriculum. There is not one uniform curriculum for the entire state of South Carolina at this time. There are just resources provided. And we can discuss um, some of the resources that are available on the South Carolina State Department of Education website. And the Aaron's Law resources, um, these are actually written into the curriculum standards. Um, so the standards um, do discuss um, what you need to cover as far as this topic in your classroom. And the links are now in the um, chat. So you can access these links on here at any time as well. You can, so some of the resources that we've connected you with are the South Carolina um, Sexual Assault, Domestic Violence and Child Advocacy Centers. And those are sorted by typically by regions and county. So they, we've provided you with all of those numbers, phone numbers as a resource and potentially who to get in contact with. Um, on the second link, it goes over um, different kinds of programs. So in here, it'll have programs that are recommended for pre-K through fifth grade, sixth grade through eighth grade, and ninth through twelfth grade. And you want to remember that these curriculums do need to follow the Comprehensive Health Education Act and making sure that these resources are in compliance with state law about what is able to be discussed and not able to be discussed. Um, but they do have multiple, multiple resources that they refer you to on the website. And they also have on here in the third link, they actually provide other resources as well, which are typically website resources, not actually curriculums, but their website links of things like coloring books, posters, video library, podcasts, um, and different type activities with links are provided on there as well. So in the links, you should have links to a list of curriculum, but also a link of websites with potential activities that could be used for Aaron's Law instruction. And all of these were distributed by the South Carolina State Department of Education. Rachel, we have time for questions now. If, um, yes, if, any yes. if there's any yeah. questions, yes, I can answer questions. Does anyone have any questions for me on Aaron's Law? Um, hopefully that was just a good overview to introduce. Um, if you have not heard of Aaron's Law or you are not fully aware of the curriculum requirements that it does need to be taught annually, grades 4K through 12th grade. Um, typically in high school setting, it's typically taught one time in um, a health education course.
And if we don't have any questions now, folks can continue to use the Q&A and chat feature throughout today's webinar. Um, and then Rachel, if you wouldn't mind putting your contact information in the chat in case people may want to reach out to you directly with their questions. Thank you, Rachel. All right, thanks again, Rachel, for sharing information about Aaron's Law. Now we're gonna transition over to Robin Cooper. Again, she's our regional program manager for the Alliance for Healthier Schools program. And she's gonna share some information today on how community coalitions and school districts can work together to work on their aligning goals as it relates to student and community health. So Robin, you can now take it over. Hi, um, everyone. Good morning, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of the panel. Um, next slide, please. Again, um, my name is Robin Cooper. I am a Healthy Schools and Communities Program Manager for the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, and I'm also Chair of Host Fire Richland County. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Today, um, um, with my time, my time with you today, I've outlined some talking points on this agenda. Um, I will be speaking about key components for collaborations between schools and community coalitions. I will also discuss how schools and community coalitions can align shared goals, the importance of collaborative efforts between community-based organizations, I will also share with you some positive uh, collaborations um, I've had the wonderful opportunity to participate in. And I will share some information about South Carolina Fitness Gram for community leaders. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> the Alliance for a Healthier Generation has a six step process which is a structural framework for school initiatives. This is founded in BEX practices to support school and district policies grounded in health and wellness. This guide supports uh, stakeholders to engage in ongoing assessments, to evaluate and identify areas of opportunity regarding um, policies and procedures to strengthen uh, health and wellness within the school environment. From the diagram on the screen, you can see that initial step is build support. Building support is foundational for collaboration, connections, and alignment of shared goals. Building support should have a collective approach for engagement and advocacy from different entities, um, such as your local, state, and um, local state agencies, um, city and county council, um, key decision makers, those that can really move the needle um, when you're trying to achieve shared goals. Um, obviously our schools and school districts and being specific with um, those partnerships with district leadership, um, SCI, student improvement council, school boards, teachers, staff, administration, and most importantly, students. Um, oftentimes we make decisions about students, for students, but do not include students in the decision-making process. Um, Community-based organizations, hospitals, FQHCs, um, local health departments, library, community members, businesses, law enforcement, just really be open um, to forming partnerships with those entities. And as it relates to my presentation, community coalitions. With all of these organizations, when we come together in solidarity, the possibilities for positive change is limitless. So I believe we're gonna go to a poll. Um, this poll, I ask, where are you in the six step process in regards to your school or community based organizations? Are you here today just to learn how do you start support? Are you at the ground level at um, step one? Or have you already assessed policies, um, developed plans, and you have some action planning going on? Or are you at the end of the um, process and Y'all have taken action and you're you're ready to celebrate success. So where are you in that? Okay, this is 
This is great. So the majority of you said that you are at that building support um, foundation. So I really hope that you get a lot out of um, the information that I will be continuing to present this morning. Next slide, please. So with any partnership, there are some key components that we need to consider. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned in my intro, I am chair of Host by Richland County, and we are a community coalition missioned with creating those sustainable approaches and changes to healthy eating, active living lifestyles through community connections. Um, so on your screen is just a collage of the different organizations that make up Host by Richland County. Um, this isn't everybody, but this is a good um, representation of uh, the stakeholders we have um, engaged in our coalition. So going back to um, key components for collaboration, I like to think of it as a recipe. And with any good recipe, there has to be some key ingredients. Next slide, please. Communication, <laughs> open communication. Uh, communication isn't just talking, it is listening. It is taking what has been said and oftentimes putting it into action. Um, open communication sets clear and concise lines for discussions, which is essential. Hosting and facilitating regular meetings is an is an important step for information sharing, resources, updates, feedback, and to discuss any setbacks if necessary. Another important of open communication is to create a space where people feel that they can share their thoughts, their ideas, their insights, and opinions. When people are open to discussions, um, people are more open to discussions, I'm sorry, when they feel like they're being heard or understood um, in a healthy way, um, where a space is created for them to um, share their individual insight and expertise. Um, be open uh, to different perspectives, um, constructive feedback and insight that is different from your own. Feedback offers an opportunity for creative solutions and innovations and being open to it can make stakeholders feel um, heard and encouraged to participate in conversations, action and project planning. Next slide, please. Our next ingredient is alignment. Communication leads to alignment, which allows for discussions to identify common goals and objectives for both schools and community coalitions to be invested in. This is an initial step for bi-directional support, not only between the two entities, but between other community-based organizations that are represented as a part of the community coalition. Shared goals provide a strong support for collaboration and assist with organizing and prioritizing strategies. Next slide, please. You always, always want to make sure that your recipe for collaboration includes inclusive and diverse partnerships. Successful collaborations between diverse um, perspectives and voices, not only between your school and community coalitions, but individuals who reside in those specific communities. Inclusivity promotes transformative ideas and strategies from stakeholders and partners and encourages a comprehensive understanding of the unique needs of each individual community. This allows for intentional and a holistic approach to complex health trends that negatively impact community health. Diverse partnerships allow for further opportunities outside of the school coalition partnership for collaboration, which supports community health initiatives. Next slide, please. And we always wanna add a dash of education and awareness Promoting education and awareness campaigns regarding school wellness initiatives within the community helps build support for schools through those collaborative efforts. This can generate engagement, enthusiasm, participation, and commitment from invested partners. Uh, next slide, please. And lastly, 
never forget um, as a part of our recipe for uh, collaboration is aligning shared um, common goals. Aligning shared goals between schools and community coalitions is foundational for creating spaces for partner participation, increasing community capacity, and maximizing impact. The following strategies on the screen um, are useful for schools and community coalitions to align their share, shared objectives, maximize resources, and work together to create healthy environments for our students, staff, their families, and the overall community. So of course, identifying those common objectives um, helps um, entities support the priorities um, all around. Once these goals are identified, it makes collaboration more efficient, streamlining efforts, and it helps to mitigate duplications. And sometimes when we work together with, um, with a lot of community partners, um, duplication can happen. Um, <clears throat> so we wanna mitigate that. <laughs> um, common objectives can include enhancements for student and staff well-being, tobacco prevention, developments in character, um, improvements for character development during instructional time, um, stronger community and youth engagement, um, or policy systems and environmental changes to support school and community health initiatives. Collaborative goal setting involves stakeholders from both schools and community coalitions. Um, collaboratively setting goals helps stakeholders to enhance um, and have a stronger sense of ownership in the process. Um, and they will be more committed to achieving those goals. Collaborative goal setting allows for flexibility as needed. Stakeholders from community coalitions and schools can reconsider or revise strategies and goals as new information, data, resources, and priorities emerge. Schools and coalitions can collectively set SMART goals or use a SWOT analysis as an initial step in the goal setting process. Sharing expertise and community resources um, gathering and sharing community resources and expertise can only enhance the capacity of the partnership between schools and communities as they work together to achieve shared goals. This may involve um, educational and training resources, funding, curriculum resources, and data. Sharing expertise while collaborating with others is a critical aspect of teamwork and can lead to better health um, outcomes in the community. And then we talked a little bit about engaging stakeholders um, and just ensuring that you have a diverse representation um, and include students, parents, teachers, school administration, community leaders, and other relevant partners. Um, seeking connections to community collaborations to engage stakeholders is important. And within the school environment, it's important to identify those school and district wellness champions to get started with collaborations. Solicit input and feedback from stakeholders to ensure that strategies and goals are um, responsive and reflective of the community needs and priorities. Um, you can here use a SWOT analysis to, util to um, utilize, I'm sorry, SWOT analysis can be utilized to engage stakeholders based off of the information obtained. Uh, another tool that uh, our coalition has used as, is a community sector inventory, and we utilize that to identify missing stakeholders needed for robust engagement with our schools. Next slide, please. School and community coalition collaborations can lead to action planning for youth health and wellness, education, and how community coalitions can support wellness initiatives within the school environment, as well as opportunities for physical activity outside of instructional time. Collaborative efforts between these organizations is crucial for maximizing resources, addressing complex 
issues comprehensively, enhancing community engagement and advocating for positive change. Mutual programming and initiatives. <clears throat> Um, collaboration can be jointly planned and implement programs and initiatives that benefit both students and the wider community. For example, um, schools may host a community health fair um, organized by coalitions or coalitions may sponsor an after school program focused on the importance of being physically active and eating healthy. Community engagement and um, family engagement and community involvement. The collaboration between schools and community coalitions can facilitate increased parent and community involvement in education and youth development efforts. This involvement can take the form of volunteer opportunities at schools and at after school events, uh, parent education workshops, community listening sessions and forums. And another important piece of um, the collaboration between schools and community coalitions is sustainability. Efforts relating to policy systems and environmental changes between schools and community coalitions are more likely to be sustainable over time when they are um, founded in PSE change. By pooling resources, sharing expertise and building strong relationships, partners and parties can work together to address ongoing challenges um, rooting, rooted in PSE while promoting positive outcomes for youth and communities. By working together, schools and community coalitions can achieve greater impact and create lasting positive outcomes for communities, for the communities that they serve. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> collaboration in action. Um, the next couple of slides are just some successful community collaborations that host by Richland County and other coalitions that I've been a part of have achieved together. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> host by Richland County in partnership with Diabetes Free SC and Clemson Extension has connected uh, with four schools in Richland District One for school garden projects. Really excited, excited about this initiative. These schools are seeking to transform outdoor space for positive relationship building and interaction among students and between students and staff, and are looking at it as an opportunity for family engagement while providing fresh produce options for residents in low access food areas. So that's the picture on the left. Um, the picture on the right is, an, um, a, is a functioning community garden. Um, our coalition has partnered with Cornelia of Columbia um, and Hyatt Park Elementary to do this community garden in one of our low access areas in Richland County. Um, this garden was actually, the project was completed um, in 2020, yes, in 2020, um, and it is still up and running today, and it's um, being tended to by uh, Cornelia of Columbia and their um, after-school program, again, in partnership with Hyde Park Elementary. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so... Host Buyer Richland County has partnered with the Columbia Food Policy Committee to do listening sessions in low access food areas. Um, and we were able to really get um, information and feedback from the residents, um, how their experience has been when trying to access food. And we've taken that information and helped to pilot a mobile market for the county. Um, we are also working with our partners in Food Share to um, look and see about expanding their um, partner site program throughout the county. Next slide, please. We've been busy. <laughs> um, we have also partnered um, with the Palmetto Conservation. We were awarded the Hostspire Mini Grant in 2021 and in partnership with the Palmetto Conservation 
and the town of Eastover and Richland County government, we were able to do some wayfinding signage at a trail off of 601. If you're familiar with Richland County, it is in Eastover, um, one of the rural parts of the county. Very beautiful scenic outdoor um, space. And we did some wayfinding signage and it was just an amazing opportunity to partner um, with the Palmetto Conservation and um, Richland County actually put in a parking lot for um, safer access to the trailhead. Um, 601 is a really busy highway. So people have to actually cross the street, very dangerous. So in partnership with them, they were able to put in a parking lot um, to make access to the trail safer. I invite you guys to go and check out our signage that is out there. Um, it is nature, so nature things are in nature. That is my warning. Next slide, please. <laughs> and one of the successes that I'm most proud of is open community use. Um, open community use in partnership with the Livewell Kershaw Coalition and Kershaw County School District. Um, for those that are not familiar, open community use refers to um, a policy where schools allow free access to the community, to their outdoor spaces and outdoor recreational um, facilities before and after school. And this policy allows um, increased access for residents to be physically active. And in pursuit of uh, this policy change, there were a number of partners that came to the table and support in um, of this policy, uh, Casey Trails, Host Spire, Kershaw County, um, Kershaw County Parks and Recs, the Sheriff's Department, um, local businesses, and this wonderful, wonderful staff and administration um, at the district level really advocated for this. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm chair of Host Fire Richland County, and we are a community coalition missioned with um, sustainable approaches to healthy eating, active living lifestyles through community collaboration. Um, <clears throat> again, this is just a representation of our um, collaborative partnerships, um, which offers um, bi-directional support, resource sharing, and increases community capacity. I'm currently um, a part of four community coalitions. Um, I and two of my teammates, um, Seth Shelby and Taylor Herlick, are very active across the state. And between the three of us, we are a part of about 20 different organizations. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanna take a moment to share some information about fit, Fitness Graham. Next slide, please. Um, another successful um, movement is what I like to call them, the South Carolina Fitness Graham. Um, this is exciting, exciting work that's being done to evaluate and improve health and fitness among um, our schools in South Carolina. Participating schools collect um, health and wellness data from students in grades, kindergarten, I'm sorry, second grade, second grade, um, fifth grade, eighth grade, and all through high school. And this information and data that is collected from South Carolina Fitness Gram is used to support programs and policies at the local, community, and state level to improve students' health from head to heart. I love their tagline. Um, they have an amazing one pager. The link is at the bottom of my slide and I will also drop that in the chat. And <clears throat> their one pager um, for community partners is very, um, is outlined, is, has a, a wealth of information regarding um, providing safe spaces to be physically active, promoting active transportation, um, working, aside long, working alongside partners. Um, there's also, yay, there it is, <laughs> um, information on physical activity resources and educating parents and children on the importance of being physically active and supporting recreational programming. I 
I, I invite you guys to check out the one pager. I use it all the time. Um, I've used it with our coalitions um, and we've used it to engage new partners to um, participate um, in our coalition. And that is it for me today. Um, thank you guys so much for allowing me to speak with you. And if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you so much, Robin and Rachel. Um, we do have some questions in the Q&A. Uh, Melinda Moody asks, can a web training be sent out by email so that I can use it for my staff? Hey, Melissa, I'm wondering if that question was specifically in reference to Aaron's law. While we maybe wait on clarification from Melissa, Rachel, I was wondering, there were a lot of great questions in the Q&A that you responded yeah. to. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind just touching on some of those in case anybody missed it and have the same questions. Okay. Um, so again, the instructional requirements again for Aaron's law. Um, so the way the law is written, it states in the memorandum that it should be taught once every year in grades four year old kindergarten through 12th grade. Now for elementary school, um, health is typically taught in each grade within elementary school. Typically students have a physical education um, course in middle school. Um, that should be every year, depending on what the requirements of um, your district says. So follow what your district says as far as um, if it is required at your middle school or if students are taking like another course, um, like dance, for example, um, or maybe they're not participating in a physical education class because bands is allowed. You would have to be kind of creative to make sure the students got that instruction. But as far as high school goes, um, it's typically only required to be taught one time in high school. Um, so in our district, we have a personal health course, and that is where the topic is covered. Um, so that would be um, just making sure that you're in compliance with the law, that it is being covered in 4K through 12th grade. Um, should be pretty easy to incorporate in elementary school. Um, how far, as far as middle and high school, it depends on what your schedule is for each district. Um, as well. So are there any trainings offered for teachers on Aaron's Law? Um, not that I currently know of right off now at the top of my head. However, we have had training in the past. Um, and so yes, Ben just commented in the chat. Thank you, Ben. Um, in the process of updating resources for Aaron's Law, once those are available, a memo will be sent out to districts. Yes. So it's kind of a creative situation now uh, where each district could use their own resources that are available um, that are approved resources, I guess you would say. Any recommendations that were given in the document that I sent with the recommendations on there. Um, but maybe the company would offer trainings as well or have training models. So again, with the process of updating resources, um, so we'll wait for Ben um, in his communication on when those resources are available. Thank you, Rachel. No um, problem. And we do have a question for Robin. How do you meet the needs of those coalitions? Do you cross promote projects to those community partners? That's a great question. Thank you. And we do. Um, and I think that's what makes it really cool to have diverse um, partners um, involved with community coalitions is you're able to cross promote um, projects. For example, our coalition um, is currently in partnership with Prisma Health. Um, we are one of three, maybe four, um, new cohorts to be added to the Healthy People, Healthy Carolina initiative through the Duke Endowment. And so right there is just a way for us to really look at sustainable change um, and um, really pull resources from different organizations as we look to assess the individual needs of Richland County and how do we meet those collectively. Um, we also, another 
project that we're working on um, is happening next week. We've partnered with the American Heart Association and Richland County government for a Go Red for Women event. Um, if y'all want to get in, just let me know. Just send me an email. I'll get you in. Um, and this event has grown. Um, last year, uh, we had about 40 uh, participants, 40, 45 participants. And this year, we're at 125. And so we're doing um, a lunch and learn to promote the importance of healthy eating and active living lifestyles, um, consuming a um, heart health diet, especially among um, women who tend to um, be heavily burdened by cardiovascular disease, especially um, women of color. And so that's another way that we have been able to um, <clears throat> build relationships and um, cross um, cross reference um, different projects within our coalition. Thank you. It looks like we have one more question for you. Uh, do you approach community coalition building in rural areas as you as you have down in areas that are not rural? Oh, mm -mm. So, um, and that and that's a great question. Thank you. Um, and this really speaks to why it is important to understand the individual needs of each community. And so, I've worked with community coalitions. In Kershaw versus Richland, hmm, it's a little different. Um, and so really understanding uh, the individual needs of that community and assessing will help you to approach um, coalition building um, as, again, as it is individualized. Thank you. I think that's mm -hmm. all the questions. Yeah, there are some great questions today. So thanks everyone for bringing those in. If you think of additional questions, you can always let us know. Um, Rachel, your contact information is in the chat. I saw that. Robin, if you haven't added yours, if you wouldn't mind doing that as well, in case people think of additional questions and want to reach out to you directly, that'd be awesome. So again, just a big thank you to Rachel and Robin um, for presenting today. Uh, you know, I say this every month, but I also mean it every month. Every time we do this, I learn something new, and I hope that y'all do too. Uh, and I want to share that we're not done. The school year has not completed yet. We still have a couple of more months left. So just a reminder that we actually have our next webinar in exactly two weeks from today on March 6th. And in recognition of National Tr Nutrition Month, we are going to bring you a nutrition jam-packed webinar session. So it's going to be on growing healthy habits with school gardens in the Faith Activity Nutrition or the FAN program. We're going to have Amy and Carolyn with Clemson Extension talking about how to build successful and sustainable school gardens. Robin actually did a little shout out for Clemson Extension and their work with school gardens and her example of um, um, successful community coalition school collaboration. So thanks, Robin, for already plugging that in for us. And then we're also going to hear from Dr. Zora Denson, who's the director of community relations in the town of Health Springs, South Carolina, who's going to talk about the faith activity and nutrition, the FAN program. So you can register for that at wholespire.org. We'll make sure that link is put in the chat. And we are most definitely looking forward to that one. And then after March 6, we have two more for you in April in honor of environmental health. Health Month. We're going to have an environmental health webinar session provided to y'all, some more details to come. And then we'll wrap up this year's webinar series, recognizing Physical Activity Month with a physical education, physical activity webinar session in May. So again, more details on that to come. Um, but you can always go to wholespire.org and check out recordings from our previous sessions, as well as re register for our upcoming sessions. Um, if you're interested in CEUs, including CHES and NCHES, you must complete our session evaluation. That will be in the link. Once you complete that, you'll receive your certificate of attendance for today. So with that, just thank you all again for your participation, and we hope to see you again in two weeks for our next webinar. Thanks, everybody.